Bonjour ou bonsoir en fonction d'où vous nous rejoignez. Je vous souhaite à toutes et à tous bienvenue à la 11e édition de la conférence internationale d'Educate. Pour votre information, aujourd'hui, euh, nous avons deux interprètes français et anglais. Si vous souhaitez suivre la version française, vous activez le bouton en bas de votre écran. Si vous souhaitez suivre la version en anglais, vous choisissez euh, le canal anglais. Si vous préférez la version originale, vous ne faites rien. Mon nom est Marie Van Breda, je suis la coordinatrice d'Educate et je vous souhaite tous la bienvenue à notre conférence. En cette journée mondiale des enseignants et des enseignantes, Educate vous souhaite la bienvenue à notre conférence internationale sur le rôle crucial de tous les Education Heroes dans la phase de reconstruction post-Covid. La conférence d'aujourd'hui débute avec une session d'ouverture avec deux keynote speakers, suivie par une dis discussion de groupe avec des intervenants de différents continents. À travers cette conférence, Educate souhaite partager des bonnes pratiques, souhaite créer des passerelles et appeler les gouvernements à assurer un apprentissage continu pour tous les élèves pendant et après la crise du Covid. La conférence d'Educate est organisée avec l'appui de VVOB, APF et le gouvernement belge. Educate remercie tous les intervenants et tous ses partenaires pour l'organisation de cette conférence. La session à laquelle vous allez assister a été co-organisée par UNICEF, la Banque mondiale, Pratam et euh, la Campagne mondiale pour l'éducation. Elle sera introduite par un speech de la part de la ministre de la coopération au développement, Myriam Kittir. Pour la modération, je peux compter sur l'appui du professeur Ides Nikes de la KU Leuven, à qui je vais bientôt donner la parole. Je vous donne encore quelques instructions pratiques, si vous me le permettez. Donc, vous pouvez poser des questions durant la conférence. Il y a euh, le, la fonction chat qui se trouve sur votre écran par laquelle vous pouvez poser vos questions. À la fin de chaque intervention, on essaiera d'y répondre. Et euh, après chaque session, euh, les enregistrements seront visibles sur notre site internet dès ce soir, où vous pouvez visionner la conférence. Si vous souhaitez communiquer durant la conférence via les réseaux sociaux, n'hésitez pas à le faire en utilisant le hashtag Education Heroes. Je vous souhaite à toutes et à tous une très bonne conférence. Et je laisse la parole à professeur Ides Nikes. Merci. And welcome to uh, Education Heroes. This is going to be a genuine heroic uh, exercise because we are going to travel around the world uh, in two hours' time. Uh, across uh, four regions of the world, and, uh, Europe, United States, uh, the Middle East and India. Uh, let's hope that technology doesn't let us down uh, this afternoon. Um, to begin with, uh, we have the pleasure of announcing and welcoming uh, Minister Miriam Kittir. Uh, for those of us uh, who are not uh, Belgians, and I understood that quite a lot of participants are from abroad. Uh, Minister Miriam Ketir is the Belgian Minister for Development Cooperation and Urban Policy. She was born and raised in Maasmechelen, which is a village in the extreme east of, uh, of Belgium, and uh, she has Moroccan roots. Um, the minister has a very warm heart, uh, not just for development, but also for education in particular. Uh, she recently uh, participated in the Global Education Summit in, in July and uh, participated in the workshop on inequalities, uh, where she made a very strong pledge for universal access to education. And there she also confirmed the Belgian commitment to uh, extra funding for girls' education. Madam Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
My name is Margo, and today I have the privilege to be the Minister of Development Cooperation and Major Cities. I am taking over the duties from Minister Kittier for one day as part of the Girls Takeover campaign of Plan International Belgium. With this campaign, we celebrate the International Day of the Girl, which takes place on October 11th. On that day, we draw attention to the needs and challenges girls face worldwide and promote girls' empowerment and the fulfillment of their human rights. And let me start, if you allow me, with what I recently saw when I visited refugee camps in Jordan and Lebanon. And that is that despite the harsh conditions, parents still do everything within their means to get their kids to school and offer them a quality education. Education is the only hope parents have left to give a better future to their children. And if they are not able to offer that education, it is my belief and conviction that it's our responsibility to help them to fulfill that hope. Because if there is only hope, and if only hope is left, what are we achieving? As a Belgian Minister of Development Countries, I do everything that is in my power to empower them. So all those girls and boys can take up their own future. And that future starts with education. Our effort is even more crucial in times of crisis, in times of pandemic. COVID has pushed every system all over the world beyond its limits. Whole societies were disrupted. And education was no exception to this rule. Schools were closed in 190 countries worldwide. This requires a lot of resilience from young people and teachers. And solutions to continue teaching were soft, but rarely accessible for the poor, for the disadvantaged. In most of our partner countries, inequalities increased. And again, girls were more affected than boys, not only by the closure of schools, but also by the long-term consequences of the pandemic. So now it is time to build back, build back the education system and build it back better. Therefore, we need to invest in inclusive and quality education and respect our commitment to SDG 4. This is something we can only achieve if we include all stakeholders of the education system. And as today is World Teachers Day, I want to stress the importance of this one stakeholder. Teachers do not only transfer knowledge to students, but also they are also good coaches, guides and mentors for a lifetime. They are teachers for the future, a future which is common. I don't have to mention the climate challenge who's affecting all of us. So now that we are going back to a more normal situation, the role of teachers is crucial, not only for the learning part, but also to accompany their students in facing the global challenges such as climate change and social and economic inequalities. Unfortunately, despite the essential nature of their profession, teachers are not always considered at their true value. The testimonies that will feed this conference will help to convince people of the importance of their task, whether here in Belgium or in our partner countries. One thing is sure, I don't need convincing. I have seen the impact a teacher can make. I have seen the solutions they can come up with. I have witnessed their passion. And even though we are a small donor, we as Belgium have developed quite some expertise when it comes to teacher training. We will continue to invest in this key profession because we know that teacher training is crucial. Crucial to increase the quality of education. Crucial to support all children in all their diversity in building a better future. Crucial in making SDG 4 come true. Before giving the floor to the experts in today's panel, I just want to highlight that my commitment to SGG4 is materializing in concrete actions. The past months, I have reconfirmed Belgium's commitment to the Global Partnership for Education with the 26 million euros for the next four years and a 2 million euros additional support for girls' education. 
In Uganda, one of the partner countries where we invest a lot of expertise and budget into the education sector, we support the Ministry of Education in its vaccination campaign for teachers by donating COVID vaccines. This to accelerate the schools reopening in Uganda. And during the pandemic, Belgium supported the ministry and teachers in developing new methods and content for distance teaching and learning. But also in other countries, we will strengthen the education sector and showcase our commitment to education by including SDG4 in our bilateral portfolios in Niger, Palestine and RDC, but also through our future support to the NGOs. So let me conclude by wishing you a fruitful conference and by hoping that today's discussion will help us in getting better results and increased impact. Impact to educate girls and boys all over the world. Impact so they can make, they can take their own future in their own hands. Impact so they can build their lives close to the place where their hearts beat for. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, Margot. And as you all can see, the future is in short. Thank you very much and wish you all good luck with the conference. Thank you, Madam Minister. And I must say you have a wonderful spokesperson. All the best. Okay, so then we can go for our first session. And for that session, we are going to travel to Washington first, uh, to uh, Quentin Wodon from the World Bank, and then from Washington to uh, New York to meet Mrs. Linda Jones from UNICEF. Um, both of them will give a presentation of a global picture um, yeah, in, under the umbrella um, slogan, say, of building back uh, better. Uh, let me briefly present the two speakers. Each of them will speak for approximately 15 minutes and there will be a possibility for the audience to um, just ask some, uh, some informative questions uh, if necessary. Um, Mr. Quentin Audon is a lead economist uh, at the World Bank um, in the field of education. But previously he was also one of the uh, specialists um, in the uh, the field of, um, of poverty, uh, in particular for Africa and uh, Latin America. So he um, is an excellent person to talk about the topic uh, today and how um, building back better can be uh, achieved uh, for the most disadvantaged groups, the most vulnerable uh, worldwide. Um, Quentin Vaudon also has one leg in the academic world because uh, he has been publishing a lot, hundreds of publications, I, sh I should say, and has been teaching at uh, uh, three universities, uh, as, long as, as far as I know. Uh, so he has a very comprehensive view of uh, the area. Um, and then we will have uh, Mrs. Linda Jones uh, from UNICEF. Mrs. Linda Jones started as a teacher herself, so she's one of those heroes. Uh, she started uh, teaching in the UK and then um, went working in uh, Guyana with the Ministry of Education there um, to uh, develop curricula. Uh, next, she worked also with the Norwegian Refugee Council and subsequently um, joined UNICEF. And at present, she's leading the Education and Emergencies team uh, at UNICEF. Uh, this is the team that offers support to governments uh, in um, emergency situations, say uh, conflict areas, post-conflict crisis, and uh, countries faced with natural disasters. And obviously the COVID crisis is one of these uh, worldwide disasters. Linda has experience in education um, in Nepal, Sierra Leone, and Somalia. Um, we will start with uh, Dr. Quentin Rodon, um, who will focus on the post-COVID recovery and uh, building back better. He will also give us some key messages and, and recommendations based on recent publications uh, from the World Bank, uh, as well as uh, other institutions. Quentin, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thank you, Ides. Um, and I hope that the presentation works well. Uh, we have a little interesting systems here with the clicker that we have to click. We don't have the PowerPoint itself. Um, so I'm actually Belgian. Uh, so uh, to all my uh, fellow compatriots, uh, hello, and, and to all the others as well. Um, before I go into the presentation, I mean, I, I just want to say that um, I, I think that indeed teachers and, and NGOs are heroes. I mean, sometimes at the World Bank, UNICEF, or others, we are a little bit far from the field. Um, and um, uh, you mentioned that I worked on poverty. Uh, when I quit a business career, I, I worked with the international movement, ATD Fourth World, that many of you might know, uh, which was founded in France, very active in Belgium and in Africa and other places. And, and I really respect fundamentally um, the work uh, that, that many NGOs are doing. So um, uh, I think we have about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, you said 15, I was told 20, so I'll try to go fast. Um, I tend to speak fast already. Um, and with Linda, uh, when we were discussing how to share presentations, uh, the idea is that I would talk um, about uh, learning poverty, which is a new concept that uh, the World Bank, uh, UNESCO and others have uh, put forward and the type of interventions that can actually help improve uh, learning poverty. Um, so um, I will uh, just uh, delve into it. So I clicked on the clicker. Um, does that work for to, sh to show the additional slides or it doesn't move right now? It doesn't move. Well, this is going to be complicated. Uh, somebody else can click this because I had, I'm clicking on the clicker and nothing seems to move. If it does not, that's okay. I will just uh, talk um, out of, ah, somebody else is clicking, wonderful. So um, the World Bank, uh, UNESCO and others came up uh, with um, a way to measure uh, learning poverty uh, a bit more than a year ago. Um, learning poverty uh, is defined as the share of the children who cannot uh, read and understand a simple text uh, by age 10, an age appropriate text. Um, and uh, in education, as you know, we have a, a wide range of different student assessments uh, that are done over the world. Um, I mean, PISA would be one of the ones that uh, Belgium participates in, as well as many other middle and high income countries. Uh, you have others, for example, in Francophone Africa, uh, we have PASEC, um, uh, which uh, is for about um, 10, 12 countries, depending on the year. Uh, so the way this is done is that for the children who are um, in school, um, uh, we combine uh, data from all those different student assessments all over the world um, uh, to make them more comparable. And we can see for the children who are in school, whether they are able to actually understand a simple text. Um, for the children who are out of school by age 10, uh, the idea uh, is that um, uh, they will uh, not be able to read and understand. They are already out of school. Um, so first, I mean, why do we use reading um, as uh, the benchmark for uh, learning poverty? I, I won't go through all uh, the elements that are on this slide, but essentially uh, the basic idea is this is really a foundational skill. Uh, if you don't know how to read by age 10, it's going to be very difficult for you um, to uh, be able to learn. Um, and to progress and go to secondary school or, or even beyond. Um, so the uh, incredible fact uh, that uh, you uh, may know about, or maybe not, um, is that in the world, uh, we have very, very high levels of uh, learning poverty. Um, so I'm uh, going to show you this slide. In poor countries, uh, or in low-income countries, about 80% of the children are uh, learning poor. Um, so eight in 10 children is not able to read that simple text by age 10. Uh, in uh, high-income countries, uh, the proportion uh, is much lower, of course, uh, 9%. Now, uh, this is a conference uh, in part for Belgian NGOs, if I understand well, uh, that are working uh, in developing countries. And that would mean that uh, quite a few um, of those uh, are in uh, Africa. Um, in Africa, uh, and these are numbers uh, before the COVID-19 crisis, uh, in Africa, about nine in 10 children are uh, learning poor. Uh, so we are really uh, in what the World Bank uh, uh, called a learning crisis. Um, now, um, sometimes uh, there is a little bit of a debate um, and, and I use myself to, to think, I mean, are, are we right to actually focus so much um, on uh, learning poverty, and, and I believe we are. Uh, 
Um, and um, uh, the debate uh, is uh, perhaps between uh, helping more children go to school um, and helping children learn while they are in school. Now, as I mentioned, that, that measure that we are using of learning poverty combines both, right? Because it looks at how well children are learning while in school, and it also takes into account the out-of-school population, uh, which is assumed to be learning poor because the child at 10 years of age is already out of school, right? But there is a very, very close connection uh, between uh, the two. Um, and to give you an example, and this is not part of the slides, um, we recently implemented a um, survey in 10 uh, Francophone countries um, in Africa as part um, of work uh, with uh, YMU, the West African Economic and Monetary Union. Um, and uh, there is a very interesting question, which is a very simple question, um, uh, that uh, is in that survey uh, with a lot of details on the answers, which is what matters. So the question is, why did your child drop out of school? Um, the question is asked to parents. And sometimes you have that question in surveys and you might have six, seven responses. In this particular survey, um, uh, it's asked in two different points of time, but, but you have about 17 different responses. So you can go in depth in terms of understanding why um, the children drop out of school. And what is striking uh, is that of course, most of the children drop out of school at the primary level, the completion rates are very low in those countries, but the main reason why they drop out of school is because they don't learn enough in school. So we shouldn't consider the learning for the children and the issue of children out of school as two separate issues. The best way, uh, or, or one of the best ways to try to keep uh, the children in school and, and make sure that the children go to school, that it's worthwhile for the families to spend money um, uh, to send the children to school, is to ensure uh, that uh, we tackle the issue of learning poverty, right? And on this graph, uh, you see um, the different levels of learning poverty uh, for different parts of the world. Now, the bad news is that uh, in low and middle income countries as a whole, um, before uh, the COVID uh, crisis, uh, we had an, a level of learning poverty of 53%. Um, now, uh, after, uh, some of the simulations, the more pessimistic scenario for those simulations, suggest that learning poverty may have increased by 10 percentage points. Um, so we are in a situation that is even worse uh, than the measures um, that I showed you. Now, these are simulations. We have to see uh, what uh, will happen in practice. It might be better, it might be worse, but clearly there's a very large negative impact of the crisis for obvious reasons. Uh, the children are out of school, and in many cases, there's very little uh, that is provided in terms of distance learning uh, for um, uh, the fact, for example, that you don't have the internet. Now, um, I am not going to go in details here uh, in the next two slides. Uh, this is just to let you know that the World Bank has put together uh, a new blueprint um, uh, for uh, how to improve uh, education systems uh, with five uh, pillars and then a number of recommendations for each of those pillars. Um, when I was trying to think about what might be especially useful to you, um, again, under the assumption that many of you are either in government or maybe in an NGO, uh, trying to improve uh, education systems and, and especially learning or even getting the children to school, um, uh, what could be more useful to you? Right, and so um, I want to focus in the next uh, six, seven uh, minutes um, uh, to, uh, on a document that the World Bank published about 18 months ago on cost-effective approaches to improve uh, global learning. So what happened is that they put together a panel of, of really experts and luminaries um, to look at the evidence and especially um, impact evaluations uh, that uh, would help us understand what works, but also what does not work, right? And so I'm going to go quickly um, through uh, the results of that study because I think it has um, uh, especially practical implications for an NGO trying to uh, do programs um, in one of those low or middle income countries. So they classified uh, interventions into um, different uh, buckets. Um, the first uh, bucket is the great buys. Um, so interventions that are highly cost effective uh, and there's a lot of evidence uh, to show that they work. Uh, the good buys, uh, they are effective. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence. There is a promising but low evidence category. Uh, there are a few studies that have been done um, and they tend to be effective, um, but we need to uh, gather more evidence. And then there's the bad buys. The bad buys is what you really should not do, uh, but there are many examples of bad buys as well. So what are those? 
Uh, so the uh, findings uh, were that the grade buys uh, were essentially giving information on the benefits and the cost and the quality of education, uh, especially to communities and parents to, to facilitate decision making. The good buys, there are quite a few, uh, and they identified uh, five main uh, categories, uh, structured lesson plans uh, with materials uh, and ongoing teacher monitoring and training. This is essential uh, because this is to help uh, the teachers teach better, knowing that many of those teachers, for example, would not have, uh, certainly not any university degrees, but many don't even uh, complete uh, secondary education. Uh, targeting teaching instructions by learning level, not by grade, reducing travel times to schools, giving merit-based scholarships to disadvantaged children and youth, and then uh, using software uh, that adapts uh, the learning level of the child uh, when uh, we already have computers and things like that. And then finally, pre-primary education for the children aged three to five. So those um, categories, six of them are considered uh, good buys. Now, the promising uh, interventions uh, with limited evidence, uh, they highlight three, essentially. Um, early childhood stimulation programs for children aged zero to two. Uh, that help parents uh, have more interactions uh, with their children. Uh, teacher accountability and incentive reform. Um, this is something that often takes a bit of time to get an impact, but, but it can have a, 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 an important impact. And then community involvement in school management. Now, uh, the bad buys uh, is essentially um, a large category in some sense, uh, because uh, if you do one intervention uh, that would provide some inputs uh, to schools um, and you don't do much else, it's not likely to work, right? And so if you provide only textbooks or um, if you provide more teachers to reduce class size, uh, if, you, if you do new school buildings, uh, or if you provide, for example, laptops, tablets, computer stuff uh, to schools uh, without thinking very carefully about how that will be used in teaching, uh, this is likely not going to work. And also cash transfers uh, works to get the children in school, especially girls. I mean, the evidence, for example, in secondary school is that cash transfers or other incentives for schooling for adolescent girls is one of the best ways to get them to remain in school and avoid child marriage. But cash transfers do improve learning tends not uh, to work um, very well. Now, I want to be a bit careful here uh, about saying that this is not the all of it, in the sense that uh, the mandate of this commission was to look at where do we have strong experimental evidence of what works to improve learning and thereby it will uh, help uh, very substantially to improve schooling also, right? Um, now, there are other things uh, that uh, are likely to work, but on which uh, we have limited evidence. And I want to give two um, examples, uh, just to say that we might not want to just limit ourselves to this, um, uh, but there are other areas that seem promising. I mean, one of them, um, and this is work based on uh, student assessments for Africa, uh, and it's a bit difficult to do experimental evaluations on that, a bit more difficult, um, but it is to ensure that we have more female teachers and especially more female heads of schools. And when we look at data on student assessment, we see a large positive association. It's not causal, we don't know, uh, between uh, female teachers and female uh, heads of schools and student learning. And finally, I just want to mention one other aspect, uh, which is the whole issue of interventions to end violence in schools. I mean, I just finished a study at the World Bank on that about uh, one month and a half ago. Um, uh, the reason why it might not be here is because for low and middle income countries, we don't have that many evaluations, but we have a lot of evaluations for uh, high income countries and a few for low income countries that show some interventions uh, that are actually succeeding in reducing violence in schools um, and that tend to have high benefit to cost ratio as well. So we shouldn't take uh, this report at the bank as uh, limiting in some way, but it provides very useful and practical guidance uh, as to what NGOs, but, but also, of course, ministries can do to improve education systems in low and middle income countries. So I hope I didn't go too long, uh, that I stayed roughly at about 15 minutes, uh, but this is what I wanted to share with you. So thank you very much, and, and I'd be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Quentin. And uh, moreover, uh, you managed to present this uh, very interesting and, and, and thoughtful um, recommendations in 
less than the quarter that was allocated to you. Uh, so that's uh, ex an excellent job. Maybe it went a bit quick because I didn't see any questions yet. Uh, can I remind the audience that it's possible to ask informative questions in the first place and we will uh, select a few um, if uh, time allows. Eh? So uh, please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, maybe if I may, uh, Quentin, I was a bit uh, surprised to see that among the bad buys uh, there is this uh, issue of cash transfers. Um, um, I, I know the literature a little bit and, and um, there is a lot of, say, praise for the Bolsa Familia in, in uh, Latin America, uh, which has been very successful in, in getting uh, children into schools. Um, does that mean that, yeah, that this, this Bolsa Familia is much less of a success uh, in real terms than um, yeah, its popularity uh, suggests? Um, or is, is it just maybe a necessary but not sufficient condition for successful uh, learning? Uh, well, so I probably went too fast and I'm sorry, I just wanted to remain in the 15 minutes uh, and uh, I don't know how many I used, but no, of course, I mean, uh, Bolsa Escola or uh, Progresa, which started this whole thing uh, in Mexico, or other cash transfers are actually often very good programs, but, but, so the slide that I had, uh, and my going too fast, uh, may have led to the impression that these programs are not useful. They are very useful to get the children to go to school, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, incentives, uh, economic incentives, whether it is a cash program or whether it is free uniforms or whether it is school feeding in schools, all of those interventions have been proven to work well uh, for increasing enrollment in school. Right? But the way it was uh, explained uh, in that report is that if your goal is to improve learning, the cash transfers will not necessarily improve learning. They would improve schooling. Right? Now, of course, schooling is absolutely necessary for learning. If you're mm -hmm. not in school, you're not going to learn. Right? So they are absolutely necessary, but they are not sufficient to improve uh, learning. So I just wanted to make that correction. I'm a fan uh, of some of those incentive programs. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, perhaps again too quickly, especially for some target groups, right? I mean, some of the groups might be the extreme poor, but other groups might be, uh, for example, girls in disadvantaged settings um, uh, that are uh, not going to secondary schools. And there's a lot of creativity um, in how to do this, right? I mean, one, uh, if I may have one more minute, if I didn't use all my time, um, I mean, the, the, the usual uh, program that we talk about is the cash transfers that are, that are the most known, right? Um, but uh, there was a very interesting program done by Niger. It's not very large, um, but the idea uh, was that the girls uh, would be sent to host families um, in, the small, in the larger villages or small cities where you would have a secondary school and the family would get a stipend and the girl would get a very small stipend. Um, but that program actually had uh, an amazing success uh, in getting uh, the girls uh, to school and in keeping them in school much more than those who did not get the program. It, it was combined uh, for those girls. Uh, with a merit-based uh, incentive in the sense that there was a selection, not everybody uh, could do it. And so some of the girls that had shown more promise uh, were uh, able to participate. Now, of course, we want to make that available to everybody in some way. Um, but what I want to say here is that cash transfer, yes, but other ways of providing incentives um, uh, to um, the girls or to their parents or to host families have a lot of, of promise. So I, I just want to correct myself if what I said was not well understood. Necessary? Uh, for schooling, uh, not sufficient for learning. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you very much uh, for this qualification. And that's indeed how you presented it, but the presentation indeed was rather short, so uh, it's good to have that extra um, explanation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I see no other questions appearing. Um, not yet, not yet so far. Um, so I suggest that we move on uh, to um, New York this time. Good morning, New York, and good morning, Linda Jones, um, for uh, being with us. Uh, as I said, um, you, with your expertise in emergency um, education, um, you will, I think, give us some lessons drawn, not just from the COVID crisis, but maybe also from previous crises. Uh, and, um, Tell us um, how you see um, 
some complementary messages to those that were forwarded by Quintin. And in the meantime, if uh, people in the audience want to add some questions also for um, Quintin Rodon, uh, please go ahead and we will um, select your questions at the end of uh, this presentation. Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everybody. I'm really pleased to have been invited to present here. It's so wonderful to hear the words from the minister earlier. Um, so this presentation focuses very much actually on the COVID crises and what's coming next. We've just heard from Quentin about the learning poverty and indeed, with the closures of schools around the world, where in 2020, about 1.6 billion children were affected by those school closures. And the impact is still ongoing. Uh, the map on the screen, you can see the darker areas show where schools were closed for the longest times. And the impact on the learning crisis is undeniable. We are estimating about 1.8 trillion hours of in-person learning has been lost. So currently there are still 17 countries with nationwide school closures due to COVID-19. That's affecting 128 million learners. And there are many more countries that haven't fully opened all schools for in-person learning for all children, meaning that some have schools open just for certain levels of education, some have regions where schools are still closed, and some areas have some children attending just a few days a week. As we heard from the minister, over the school closure period, amazing efforts have been made to deliver education. So via TV, radio, through all sorts of innovations with digital learning. But of course, children who are already marginalized, so the poorest without access to electricity and data, those people living in the most remote areas, children with disabilities, children with, from communities speaking minority languages have been very hard to reach. But great efforts have been made in many countries to include all, but the challenge has been huge for everybody. So as schools do reopen around the world, we wanted to share some key lessons for reopening schools successfully. Some of these indeed have been learned from previous crises and are true in this crisis. Um, great leadership really makes the difference. So for instance, in Sri Lanka, the government created an interministerial task force recognizing the challenge is intersectoral. Um, the design and provision of tools to assess schools re readiness to reopen have been shared in many countries and in many as well, the capacity building of school leadership on COVID-19 management. All of these help in the consistency of the approach. Good leadership includes encouraging the participation and voices of children in the youth and decision making as well. We've heard already about the importance of teachers, the involvement of teachers in the planning and implementation of reopening schools definitely adds to the success. Meaningful participation helps enforce health protocols. Engaging with teacher unions, fostering communication networks and feedback channels amongst teachers, school directors, students, families. They don't just build trust and allow for rapid response and um, rapid reactions, but also ensure clear, consistent communication, which is really important. The spotlight on gender and marginalization. Um, for example, in Ghana, their back to school campaign specifically considers the needs of girls, including pregnant and adolescent mothers as well. And also creating new flexible skill development opportunities to, um, to give people who have been out of school for a long time. Turkey have supported specific outreach campaigns to refugee and vulnerable learners with tailored information on accelerated learning programs and Turkish language courses. 
we learned early on in the Ebola crisis um, in West Africa some years ago that by having really targeted campaigns that really seek out the children who are most likely to drop out of school, you can really make a difference to who comes back. And that's been very important in this crisis as well. We've heard already about innovation, innovative ways to reach children um, while schools have been closed, including children with disabilities. And as school reopening and recovery is happening, there is lots of exciting things happening with these innovations being incorporated back into children's education as the schools reopen. For example, the um, digital learning packs, which are called Padlets, created in Jordan. These are printable tools, as well as being able to use on digital devices. They are now being used for catch up as children re return to the classroom. And in East Timor, where teachers created all sorts of um, learning resources through TV, through radio, through YouTube, um, available on their learning passport in East Timor, uh, they are now being incorporated into the classroom as extra resources um, and, and different way of teaching as children resume their lessons. Schools and learning environments are, of course, more than just places where children learn. For many, schools provide the opportunity to be supported by their peers and teachers, a place of safety and nutrition, and a place where they can get structure and routine in their lives. So the evidence on the negative effect of these school closures are very similar to the um, evidence of school closures in conflict areas as well in that the children's safety, their mental health and well-being, it, it, the impact is overwhelming. Research shows that there are increases in stress and anxiety among children and adolescents, and that the disruption to routines, to the education, to their recreation, as well as concerns for family income and health, is leaving many children and adolescents feeling very afraid, angry, and concerned for their future. So let's listen to 13-year-old Lenny explain her experience in Ecuador. Dejamos subir a los caballos y hay un recorrido de seis horas en los caballos. Pues por el clima ahorita a veces los tiramos siete horas. Pues depende del clima como esté. Y salimos a veces de madrugada. Salimos a la una y acá llegamos a las seis. A veces. Pero cuando nos toca salir de tarde, pues salimos a la una de la tarde y vamos a las seis. Bueno, lo bueno es que ella me explica todo. Me va explicando paso a paso los detalles y todo. Bueno, y lo malo es que no tengo compañeros con quien jugar, con quien compartir como lo hacía antes. And there we can see the extremes that some teachers and parents and children have been going through over the COVID crisis to really try to ensure that learning is continuing. And indeed, many teachers have been traveling around uh, children's houses to not only make sure learning continues, but also to give psychosocial support to children um, and if you're interested in seeing more examples, there are on the UNICEF Facebook some back to school diaries where children present their own experience of not only um, the continuity of learning while schools are closed, but their experiences they travel back to schools as well. So the prompt resumption of in-person learning and access to other school environments to children for play are really critical actions to protect children and help accelerate the recovery in the aftermath of the crises. And some of the recommendations specifically about mental health and psychosocial support include 
promoting a culture in which mental health and well-being is talked about openly and where children, adolescents, caregivers and teachers understand the importance and links between good mental and physical health and learning. In Thailand, for example, the Sound of Happiness campaign was implemented where people shared their experiences of struggling with mental health challenges, destigmatizing the issues and promoting available services and platforms for other adolescents to seek professional help. Promoting children's participation in schools and learning environments, we've mentioned this already in all aspects, but children need opportunities to express their opinions and exercise their agency in the decisions that affect them. So, for example, in a number of countries, focus group discussions were held with children to develop the school protocols for school operations during COVID-19. Teachers are playing a crucial role in supporting children's learning and well-being, as we've mentioned already. And supporting teachers to manage their own mental health and systematically strengthen their knowledge and capacities to promote students' mental health and well-being is essential. Some countries, uh, teacher unions have developed peer-to-peer -peer networks to, to support teachers' mental health. In many countries, uh, governments have supported teachers with training and tools to address the mental health and psychosocial support needs of children after experiencing prolonged school closures. In Belarus, UNICEF and partners provided psychological assistance to COVID-19 frontline workers, including teachers, providing practical tips for managing stress and preventing burnout as well. Collaborating across sectors is, uh, of course, really important to ensure that referral pathways are established with the health sector, ensuring school health programs address the current issues and that social service workforce is working closely with schools to address child protection issues effectively. Health and well-being is central to learning. So as we look to the challenges of the triple crisis, so that's the learning crisis, the economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of COVID-19 on children's health and well-being, a comprehensive approach where everyone continues to play their key roles is paramount for the recovery. UNICEF, the World Bank and UNESCO have launched this year a mission recovery and that's to get all children back into learning, supported with these comprehensive um, tailored measures um, and supporting teachers as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. Um, I must say you started with uh, some very gloomy figures. Um, I was astonished seeing that so many millions and millions of children are still not going to school due to school closures. But the rest of your um, presentation was so hope giving, so warm hearted um, that, uh, yeah, it, it uh, sounds extremely encouraging uh, for us. Um, the main lesson that I draw from it, uh, there are two lessons actually, is the need for comprehensive action, intersectoral action, a lot of flexibility as well in addressing uh, new problems uh, in schools. Uh, that's for one. Uh, my second lesson from your speech is that um, not only teachers are the heroes, but also the learners themselves. Um, uh, when uh, we heard that testimony of uh, the girl from Ecuador, if I'm right, um, yeah, that, that is also, that demonstrates the, the, the courage and the resilience of, of children. In the meantime, uh, we got some additional questions for Quentin, not yet for uh, Linda, maybe they will pop up in the next few minutes. Um, but Quentin, are you ready to um, answer a few um, additional questions? Uh, the first one is, how about the impact and cost effectiveness of health and nutrition? related interventions on learning. For example, vision and hearing screening, vaccinations, meals, etc. Um, and the second question uh, for you is a bit more, say, wide ranging. Uh, with SDG4 uh, getting out of reach already, is the World Bank now focusing on a more feasible education target? A bit provocative, I would say. Right. Um, so first on health, um, yes, I fully agree uh, that health interventions are absolutely crucial 
Um, I'm actually working right now uh, with colleagues from the health practice at the World Bank, um, and we are trying to um, do three things. Uh, define um, a package of essential health interventions in school, um, two, um, estimating the cost of some of those uh, based on what we have from the literature, and then uh, three, showing some of the benefits. So the, the package of health interventions uh, has 10 interventions, um, so we need to finish the work uh, next month, uh, so it will be available soon. Um, and if I uh, just want to mention a few of those, um, I mean, uh, one of them, uh, well, I won't have the time to, to mention a few of those, I guess, but one of them is what you cited, uh, which is um, school eye health. Um, and uh, you know that in the world, a lot of people uh, need uh, a pair of eyeglasses, right? I mean, me too, you have, I have my little eyeglasses here. Um, but more seriously, um, these are uh, programs uh, that are uh, still basically non-existent or almost non-existent, for example, in Africa. Um, I mentioned PASEC, uh, which was a student assessment data uh, for uh, 10 uh, West African countries earlier. Um, and the 2014 round of PASEC shows uh, that uh, only about uh, two or three percent of uh, second graders uh, have uh, vision screening in school uh, and six percent of sixth graders. So uh, it, it's amazing. It's, uh, and, and it is something that is relatively easy to do um, and that can have a lot of benefits and that doesn't cost much, right? I mean, why is it relatively easy to do? Um, I mean, we all remember when we were in school uh, that we had these little things that we have to read, right, from far away. Uh, teachers can do the screenings themselves. They are, they, you don't need uh, a ton uh, of expertise. You need a bit of training, but teachers can do the screening. And then providing pairs of eyeglasses uh, can be done extremely cost effectively. Um, and, and then what you need is also, of course, referral for the children who need to be referred. And, and I'll give one example because we are just right now doing a small evaluation of a program in Liberia. Um, uh, the unit cost uh, per child uh, of the school eye health program was just above one dollar. Uh, I mean, a bit more than one dollar. I mean, it can be a bit more expensive. Uh, there's a paper recently published about Cambodia um, and um, Ghana, I think, or Kenya. I forgot where it was two or three dollars. Uh, that's not per child who gets eyes glasses. That's, that's for all of the children, including the screening, the eyeglasses and the referral. So these are things that can make a huge difference. Um, uh, if you look again at the PASEC data um, and uh, ask uh, to what extent does um, difficulty seeing or difficulty hearing in school affect um, students' scores, uh, so how well uh, they do on the math test and, and the language test, uh, the effects are as large, if not larger, as most of what we usually uh, think about, right? Uh, for example, uh, the socioeconomic background uh, of uh, the parents or the quality of the teachers and so on. So mm -hmm. school school health, uh, and I gave one example, school eye health is extremely important. Um, and some of those interventions can really help um, the uh, children go to school. And uh, we think that actually school health is also particularly important for adolescent girls, but I won't go into the details. Okay. Now, your second question, Ides, is about the World Bank and, and are we abandoning uh, SDG4? No, we are not, of course, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We are uh, in, in many ways part of the UN system. Um, the, the idea of the learning poverty uh, measure and target um, was to try to, to focalize a bit more the attention on that, right? Because we know that first, if the children go to school, I mean, there's actually a lot of benefit to go to school, even if you don't learn. And, and I mean, the socialization aspect and so on, right? But learning is fundamental. Um, and if the children don't learn, uh, I mean, they will drop out uh, much faster. And, and if they don't learn, uh, many children will not go to school. When you look at, mm -hmm. at, at what parents say, uh, not learning is a key reason for not sending the child to school, right? And so okay. the other original target was to halve learning poverty by 2030. Now, that will be tougher to achieve with COVID, um, but, but, but we believe it's still feasible. So it's not abandoning SGD4, but it is trying to focalize more attention to the learning crisis, one of the three crises that Linda mentioned. Sorry for being a bit too long here in my answer. No problem, no problem. It was uh, very interesting. And uh, maybe Linda wants to add a few comments to the questions on uh, health related interventions and uh, maybe some some points that you wanted to highlight but had no time to highlight uh, you have a uh, say two minutes to add something 
Sure. Um, one of the things I would say that the resumption of in-person learning will mean that a lot of the school feeding programs that have been missed um, around the world can restart again. Um, we know how important these are um, when it comes to the nutrition of children and how linked the nutrition of children and uh, learning achievement are for um, across the world for children. Um, as Quentin touched on uh, health measures in school and also uh, water sanitary um, sanitation and hygiene in schools are also really important, particularly for girls and particularly for adolescent girls as children come back into schools. Um, and it's shown where, the, where there are wash facilities and good wash facilities available, the attendance of girls is, is far greater at the secondary level. So really super important as well. Thanks. Thank you. A final question to you concerning this, those uh, school, measure, uh, school closures, sorry. Um, yeah, given that so many schools are still not in operation, um, is this a, a matter of political will, is of anxiety, or what, what are the causes? And, and what would what would you um, what would be your advice to those schools in order to to get running uh, again as soon as possible? I think there are multiple reasons. I, I think it's um, too difficult to pin it down to one particular reason. But one thing we know from um, the evidence around the world, we work very closely with. Um, the WHO and also with UNESCO, with a technical advisory group made up of some of the world's best uh, virologists and um, immunization specialists uh, um, and uh, various different experts, pediatricians around the world. Um, the one thing we can see is that it's possible to keep schools open during COVID outbreaks. Um, uh, there are measures that can be taken, such as uh, distancing, such as mask use if it's required, such as um, basic ha hand washing hygiene, um, all different measures that can be taken to mean that schools can operate safely. And in many cases, we see that children are better off in school than out of school. Um, I think one of the big issues still is on clear communication. That, that great leadership that I mentioned in the presentation is really important. So that communication to parents, to children, to teachers, to school administration is super clear. Um, and through media as well. All of those channels of communication is very, very important to ensure that any concerns and anxiety is, is addressed and allayed and um, those systems of feedback mechanisms and monitoring are in place to ensure that um, any issues or concerns can be dealt with super fast. Thank you very much again. Um, uh, this closes uh, this first part of our session today. Uh, we will immediately move on to uh, the next part. See you in a few seconds. All right, here we go again. And um, yeah, as you may know, the um, panel this afternoon consists not so of two speakers, but of four. And uh, we're going to uh, introduce the two other speakers by means of small personalized uh, interviews and uh, shorter presentations. And uh, we start with Mrs. Uh, Anaporni Chandrasekhar, if I pronounce your uh, name correctly. Um, Anaporni Chandrasekhar is, uh, was educated uh, in automobile engineering, um, but she's currently a senior manager in digital innovations at Pratham Education Foundation. She's a specialist in digital learning, upscaling of pilots in this field and open learning initiatives for diverse learners. And she undoubtedly has a lot to tell us uh, in the context of um, this COVID crisis on uh, the use and, and, and the limitations of digital education. 
Um, Anna Porni, the lockdown periods have forced many schools to switch from face to face to distance education, often in a very improvised way, uh, involving a risk of uh, excluding disadvantaged uh, groups from education. Can you give us examples of uh, successful uh, reconnecting uh, the unconnected people and, and boosting the digital skills also of teachers and pupils and maybe also their parents um, and local communities in these circumstances? And how did your foundation contribute to this? Anna Porni, the floor is yours. You've got five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has, like Kenton and Linda pointed out, has affected children in many ways. And we were trying to reach them with any other organization at the level that they were. We knew that learning and learning interventions probably during the pandemic was difficult to do. So we tried to engage them in activities that could keep them stress-free, keep them engaged, and make them have fun. Uh, there was a lot of stress, a lot of job loss during that time. And we wanted to support children and communities cope with it better. So that's why the presentation is called Transforming Through Communities, Content, and Connections. So uh, one of the first things that uh, we realized when we were trying to assess our communities, Stefan works with close to 12,000 communities across 21 states in India. And uh, when, we, when we started our interventions, one of the first things we did is we tried to map children the devices that were available to them. And we realized that one solution cannot be applied to all. We can't have one kind of solution that works for all children because the kind of digital infrastructure, the kind of community stakeholders, and the kind of content that they need is very different. So uh, based on the kind of digital infrastructure that is available, we chose our channels. So we diversified. We, before the pandemic, we were just making videos and games around early childhood education, around primary education, and around primary education. But what we did then was we said, OK, we can't reach all students this way close to 40% students in every village in many of the populated states of India do not have access to a smartphone or an internet. So we tried to go into low-tech mediums like SMS, TV, radio, and created content remotely for these mediums. So uh, with respect to our own communities, we tried these interventions, demonstrated these models, but also actively engaged with governments and partners based on their needs and advise the governments based on their needs, which medium they should be using. So we diversified into seven different mediums, worked with different community stakeholders, and chose the digital infrastructure carefully. One of the things that Linda mentioned was the language diversity, and that it's not available in all languages. We tried to uh, do this by giving access to content in 11 to 12 different languages. We know that we couldn't reach everybody, but we tried to create it in as much of contextualized form as possible. This is one of the activities that we sent in a very early days. It was an activity about using the bangles that they have at home to create a peacock uh, that the children could do together or alone, using the material that was available to them. And this is how we drafted the message. This is a WhatsApp message that we sent them. And they could easily watch the video and create an activity like this at home so that they were engaged. Similarly, uh, when we moved to uh, other communities where internet or smartphones weren't available, we chose SMS. This is a 160 character message of a story for language learning. Similarly, we would send addition subtraction based games in a 160 character message. The text that you see there on the screen is in Asimov, it's one of Northeast India's languages. And similar to this, we created this in multiple different languages based on what was accessible to the school. We did not limit ourselves to just sending the message. We mapped students in the community. This is the map of a village. We mapped students, we mapped uh, girls and boys based on the access that they have. We collected their phone numbers. The ownership of the phone was 
uh, measured what type of phone it was and accordingly we sent the messages to them. Once we delivered the message, we did not stick to just broadcasting the message. There was a feedback mechanism that was established. Because with any edtech intervention in a low tech area, a human connect is very important. We can't just stop by giving devices or sharing content at a broadcast level. We needed to have a step-by-step -step mechanism where the students get the message from a Pratham teacher who has five to 10 villages. The Pratham teacher sends it to parents or volunteers who he or she engages in the community. And then they sit with the students and do the activity. We collected weekly information on how many students were receiving the message, which is access, how many of students were engaging with the message, which is engagement, and how many were actually understanding what was there. And this led us to also see what was the mood in the village, what was the context that we were working in, and accordingly make tweaks to the scenario and to the content that we developed. Finally, when it comes to education heroes, there are four education heroes that I would like to highlight. Parents, uh, many of our parents, especially in the early childhood age group, were parents who were not literate themselves. But the activities that we gave were about uh, for a mother to count tomatoes with her child at home. So she, we gave activities that were designed with the material that was avail available to them and with a lot of visual access so that they could use that material to engage with their children. Similarly, we tried to create material for community stakeholders, grandparents in the communities, the village leaders, and how can they really support uh, communities uh, and children learn better? Can they provide an internet connection at a village level? Can there be shared smartphones that can be used by children, shared phones that can be more accessible to children? Finally, the youth, this has actually been one of our biggest learnings during the pandemic, engaging with youth in a model of education for education. We trained youth in digital readiness. We gave them courses to skill themselves digitally, and then they really became our advocates on the ground working with children. So we were giving them an education of digital upskilling, which they later took to kids and children in their community to help them learn better. And finally, the teachers, they have been really the backbone of this entire system, ensuring that the right content reaches everyone and everyone is engaged and making remote learning possible really these really difficult times. So in many ways, all of them have been education leaders in the last two years. Schools have yet not opened completely in India. They are partially open. And we hope that children can go back to school, but we can continue this in India. Okay, Is, and did you finish your presentation, Anaporni? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we had some problems with the um, say with the sound, um, so um, we apologize, of course, for the difficulty. And and we are all aware how challenging it is to communicate around the world, even with uh, good technology. Um, if you would happen to have a headset, maybe that could help for the rest of the discussion. I don't know. Um, but otherwise, I, I understood from your presentation that uh, it is very important not just to look at technological solutions, but also at, say, the training issue and uh, community building around uh, technologies and, and to involve all partners, all stakeholders in uh, the solutions. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I remind the audience that it's possible to ask questions also to Anna Porni and to uh, our next speaker. Um, so please uh, use the chat function and, and forward your questions and, and even comments uh, to us if you like. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Rifat Sabah. We now move from India to Palestine. Uh, Mr. Rifat, uh, Rifat Sabah is president of the Global Campaign for Education. He studied at Birzeit University, if I pronounce correctly, and at the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, he's the Director General and also the founder of the Teacher Creativity Center in Palestine, and he's also uh, General Secretary of the Arab Campaign for Education and President of the Arab Network for Human Rights and Citizenship Education. So you could say Mr. Sabah 
is really a forefighter of uh, the right to education for all. He, by the way, received uh, an honorary PhD from Al Amarif University in Yemen for his role in education in Yemen. And then he was elected president um, of the Global Campaign for Education. So Mr. Uh, uh, Rifat Sabah, um, after the sanitary crisis and the learning loss that uh, was caused by it, uh, the global education sector is now being faced with a financing crisis due to the economic fallout of the pandemic. And this will happen in a context where additional resources are needed uh, to repair the damage incurred by learners. How does the global campaign for education envisage this future? And what leverages can be used to mobilize resources in this context? Please, Mr. Sabah. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, actually, the most things that I am proud of, I was teacher. This is uh, where I got all my experience. Uh, and this is where I got my passion. Uh, and I agree with all the speakers. And the, we are at the same level of describe uh, what happened, but maybe not all of us at the same level to see the future. Einstein, he said, uh, they asked him, uh, why you are يعني, so worried about the future? He said, because simply we are going there. So that's why we are thinking about, uh, uh, and we should together think about the future. Um, يعني, in the beginning, uh, some lights that Linda and uh, Mr. Cotin uh, actually, they mentioned it which is this pandemic uh, has really uh, heavily uh, affected the economic and the social uh, situation, uh, which is exist in some country, the situation was very bad and the pandemic is just increased uh, uh, the, the bad situation, especially when we speak about the SGD4. We had uh, those who is working, to push the agenda, the education agenda, to be uh, achieved by 2030. Now we have to go back uh, again and to start to think how we can push the agenda to be able to reach 2030, but which I am, I doubt that uh, it will happen after this uh, pandemic. The poverty, as Mr. Uh, also Koten uh, um, mentioned, uh, the poverty has been increased. Even the World Bank, he mentioned that uh, by 2021, uh, an additional of 100 to 150 million people will live uh, uh, with $2, which is, this is uh, unbelievable and unacceptable. And we are speaking to achieve uh, the right to education and the right to his and the social also uh, protection. Uh, and in this, uh, uh, situation, we, we are facing also some problem that most of the donors, they are unwilling uh, like uh, to take concrete measure to scale up and the thinking the public financing of development and an ability to agree on a multilateral resolution uh, for uh, the debt issue. This is another problem that we are uh, really maybe will face. So, uh, and we we are uh, unable to create a global body, even to deal with the massive tax avoidance and evasion, which is strongly uh, will uh, hit the country in the global south. So all this point is very important when we are uh, thinking about uh, the future. So uh, the, the economic crisis also within this uh, the country and globally will likely lead to physical austerity, increases in poverty and the fewer resources available for investment in public service from both domestic expenditure and development aid. All of these will lead to crisis in human development that continue long after the pandemic has ended. Also the school that Linda mentioned when we speak about reopening uh, the school, the school is uh, really uh, play a critical role around the world in ensuring the delivery of essential health service nutrition meal, protection, psychosocial support. Thus the school closure have also endangered 
children overall be, well being and development, not just their learning. So uh, we are looking at the other side of the school. As Linda uh, mentioned that we are not just going to the school to good Arabic and English and mathematics. There is another side that the, the, the children develop their self uh, in the school. Uh, also, uh, the, there is a report issued by UNESCO and World Bank, uh, which is regarding uh, financing uh, uh, issue. Uh, in February 2020, uh, in, in February 22, in 2021, it states that education budget are not adjusting suitably. So uh, to challenge uh, what the pandemic has in brought. So despite additional funding needs, two thirds of low and low middle income countries have in fact cut their public education budget since the one is of the COVID pandemic, according to the same report. So uh, all these uh, challenges that we uh, will, will, will face uh, uh, in the coming future, and you can, uh, even to uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, before the pandemic, in, 19, uh, in 2018, 2019, the high income country were spending annually uh, around uh, 8,500 uh, uh, for every child or youth education com compared with $48 in low income country. So the, the, the pandemic will widen this gap. This is another also we have to take in our consideration and uh, uh, the World Bank uh, speak and this is right also in our region it's around 51 uh, percentage from the, the fourth grade. They cannot read and write. And now from 51 percentage all over the world, it will reach 63 percentage, which is a high percentage for those who will have learning loss. Uh, uh, maybe the World Bank, they named it uh, Lord uh, Learning Poverty. I use the learning loss. I, uh, some people, uh, they use another uh, uh, concept, another words. So, and, and this is another problem that we are not agree about what is going on. Because some people, they said, we don't lose anything because there is nothing to lose. Why we are saying learning loss? If, uh, uh, so uh, this is another debate that is, uh, is happening. So the combination of being out of the school and the loss of family also, uh, this is another problem because by the pandemic may leave uh, a lot of girls uh, vulnerable and may uh, aggravate exclusion and inequality, particularly for the person with disability and other marginalized groups. So those uh, you can imagine with those family, who, uh, with those people who lost their family and there is, an, there is no uh, other resources that can support them. External financing is key support to education opportunity for of the world poorest. This is uh, the sentence that uh, has been said in the beginning from Stefania, uh, the director of the IUSCO. Uh, and then now, I, I, like I think all of us agree about uh, the the, uh, the bad effect of the pandemic, despite there is uh, opportunities also in, in this pandemic. But how GCE? Envision the future. GCEC, the immediate future after the, the pandemic will leave the condition of inequality exposed in all areas, especially in the education, the situation of exclusion, of population that have historically has been discriminated against will be more evident. We will see more now, huh? the, these things. Physical weakening will have negative impact on education budget and will depend on the political will of government to try to level these effects so that excluded population can benefit from affirmative action. Governments may increase their pressure on, on civil society. And it's happened. Now, they, uh, the, some of the government, they know that the crisis is coming. Because they know the crisis is coming, so they have to, to reduce the support of the public uh, service, especially education and health, and they will expect that the people will uh, are present. They will refuse. They will do something. That's why now they are shrinking the space of the civil society. 
They are following us in everywhere, in the Facebook, in the Twitter. In, they are trying to shrink the space of the civil society, which is, uh, this is also uh, a dangerous, and we expect this in the coming uh, period. Moreover, the government in to attempt to avoid their responsibility. The, the government, uh, they try to, uh, to escape and to put uh, this load on the private sector. So the, we are afraid from uh, privatization of the education because the, the government will be saying that we are not able to fund because the crisis and they will hit the civil society, will even uh, push for the political uh, parties who can criticize them. Then they will give the, the place for the private sector and we have problem in privatization of the education because the, the poor people will pay the price again. Education is a human right but doesn't stand alone. Rights can be fragmented and in, in, uh, it cannot be uh, fragmented. And in this context, health and social will be go hand by hand with the education. And I am, I, I, I am, I am not with the, the division to work on education separately from health, from the social reduction. Those who cannot, uh, they, do, they don't have money, they cannot go to education. Those who have health problem, they cannot go to education. So, these three sectors should work together and the network all over the world should be really, uh, uh, we should work uh, together. And the, the other things is the debit issue. There is some country, they have 100 million dollars, like Sudan. How they can uh, uh, go? They pay also, they pay benefit from this uh, debt. So uh, the, uh, this is another, uh, some country will face uh, also, the ability uh, to achieve the education agenda if the debt uh, stay on their shoulder. So GCE trying uh, to, uh, to have a campaign in order to push the, the uh, international uh, country and donors uh, to cancel it, uh, the debt issue or to uh, relieve it or uh, to swap it or uh, we, we want to especially and Regarding those who is really poor, we have to work on canceling, cancel the debt issue. So, um, uh, in order that this uh, this uh, money, or when they cancel the debt, or they reduce it, or they relieve it, or they swap it, they should go to the health and uh, uh, education, especially the teachers that you mentioned is the core of. Uh, the sol uh, the, the, the solution. So uh, uh, also the community, uh, the international community should also facilitate access to education and informative system and the platform in the best uh, condition. Some of the country now, uh, like uh, Anna, she mentioned, some of uh, countries like in Yemen, uh, the internet is very weak. You know, they cannot uh, communicate through uh, internet. So the radio, the TV, all these uh, techniques is very important uh, to be uh, uh, served. Uh, the issue of poor countries that are suffering from heavy debt, as I said, should be uh, also uh, support. Um, uh, Linda, she mentioned that we have to support the, re the reopening the, the school. This is, uh, we should have a strategy, uh, not just opening the school because uh, uh, we are now uh, seeing that the, the school is closing again. So it should be, there is uh, uh, protocols, uh, like Save the Children, they publish a, a very strong manual that can be used uh, in this uh, part and the GCE is doing campaign regarding that. Uh, the recovery of learning must response emergency. This is um, the learning loss uh, is very important when we speak about also uh, uh, technology and internet. So we should really uh, think about how we can help those countries who, who will face a problem in this uh, issue. Also, um, uh, regarding the proper solution for tax justice and tax evasion are imperative in order uh, for low and lower immediate country to recover and to be able to design effective plan and uh, measures. Uh, we should begin to look at the education, health, social, as I said, well-being and other needs of people as rights. 
and enough financing should be secured for and lower uh, for low and lower middle uh, income country to achieve real development in these sectors, but not considering this as a humanitarian aid, uh, because usually uh, they give the money and uh, they uh, consider it's a hum humanitarian. Uh, and uh, in, in this way, like if you give uh, uh, money for uh, uh, Yemen uh, as a humanitarian, what the teachers can do who don't have even uh, salaries, you have to work as a political also in this. The solution is not individual that implies one specific area or country. It's a common cause that concerns the world, the whole world. So Mr. GCE Sabah? is our... Yeah, sorry for uh, yeah. interrupting you. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, um, but we are running a bit over time. Um, I'm sure that a, a number of the topics you want to address uh, will come back uh, during the, the discussion later on. Could you maybe try to wrap up in uh, one or two minutes and, and that we can yes, uh, move to the uh, discussion? Now you see, yes, uh, uh, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, Yes, GCE now is working on uh, one of the uh, campaign that we are working on, it's One Million Voices campaign. We are trying to localize our advocacy to get voices from the ground in order to make the immunity at the national level, because as much as the national level have immunity to raise their voices, to be aware about what is going, as much as we will be strong at the global level. And also now we are de doing uh, uh, debit research, we are trying to reproduce a knowledge, and uh, this research is now is going on on different uh, countries, where is the, our coalition there can be used this information to develop their uh, advocacy. Also, now we are uh, trying to develop uh, education in emergency campaign, where we, uh, we will focus on those countries who is really under uh, emergency by using all the techniques that we can uh, in this. So the most important now things is that we are going to focus on the financing education. This is the most important by using all the techniques I by touching all the things that uh, uh, maybe help to increase the uh, financing in these countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rifat Sabah. Uh, and I now understand why they elected you as president of the Global Campaign for Education, because you have such a comprehensive view and, and such a strong message um, that um, all of us uh, undoubtedly um, understood very well and, and share with you. We um, offer you all our support. Um, I'm sure that some of these points will, will pop up again uh, during the discussion. Uh, but time has n come now for um, the, the, the panel to uh, discuss mutually. And um, yeah, while the audience is still encouraged to forward some questions or, uh, or statements, um, I would like to kick off with a question concerning those heroes, but heroes at the grassroots level. Um, could uh, each of you maybe uh, tell us um, whom you consider as examples of, of heroes in uh, the uh, COVID crisis uh, in education um, and, and how we can share, um, say, our appreciation and, and support for them. Um, the first part of the discussion will focus on what happens at grassroots level. The second part will then focus on, say, the more um, national and global levels. So let's start with the grassroots level. We're not talking just about uh, teachers, but also of other stakeholders. Who wants to kick off? I can start. Okay, um, Anaporni. I hope the audio is better now. Yeah, it's um, better. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, for me, uh, I mean, from a community and grassroots perspective, um, I feel that uh, parents and young uh, siblings have really been uh, the education heroes during the pandemic. Um, because when the teachers couldn't reach their students, they really facilitated the learning to happen. They, in many in many contexts, they have gone beyond uh, what was delivered to them 
to ensure the children in their hamlets were learning. They created groups of children, did catch up activities with them. And there was not a lot that they were getting in return. Yes, we did train them on digital skills. Yes, we did give them access to vocational skilling uh, on our portals, but they did this at our, out of their own willingness for their community and took it up as a responsibility to the children in their community. And that doesn't happen easily. So there was no stipend or remuneration that was given. The remuneration was digital skills that they were gaining through the process. So I feel that they have really contributed and parents of course because um, like uh, all other family members in the household they were also taken up by surprise and in many uh, rural in, uh, contexts in India parents are not very educated and in many ways the community and school work in silos the education really happens in the community and uh, in the school and the community the parents think it's their responsibility only to send students inside schools and not really focus on whether they are learning well. And uh, in the true Pratham way, we feel that every child in school should be learning well. And that's what I think the parents really try to do. Through the medium, through the content, and through the tools that were available, and through the uh, activities that they could do with their children, they really supported their children during these times. I feel parents, as well as older siblings or youth, have really focused on uh, education in the last one year. Thank you for highlighting this. Um, I would not have thought in the first place of siblings, uh, uh, to be honest. But you're right. Um, and more generally speaking, we could speak of uh, buddies. Uh, and there have always been buddy programs also in the north. Uh, and and um, my experience was that buddies were, during the COVID crisis, very much left to their own. They were isolated themselves and, and nobody um, sort of catered for them to reorganize support. And I, I'm sure that such support could be given um, even from, from a distance by telephone or um, yeah, via other means uh, and in safe context in, in public spaces, for example. Um, do you have the experience that in, in other countries um, such buddy programs could um, be pursued during the crisis? Anybody from the panel? Not immediately. <laughs> okay, uh, let's turn to some some other um, heroes. I'm, I'm, I must say I'm uh, happy with the example because it's a sort of forgotten forgotten group, eh? the the siblings and the and the buddies, um, who are very important, uh, especially for disadvantaged children. If I could um, yes. perhaps add to that. I think some of the most amazing teachers, those who, um, particularly when countries were in full lockdown, were busy pulling together packs of um, paper materials and trekking many cases for long distances to get them actually delivered to children's doors um, over and above expectations i think recognizing that electricity and data and all of those restrictions for many in the world so the the need for print materials remembering that many schools closed very fast so it was um, difficult for those packs to be organized before um, schools were closed so those teachers who really went um, that extra mile to ensure that every single one of their children in their classes had materials so that they could continue learning for what was assumed would be a short period of time um, was really impressive. But also teachers took the opportunity to create WhatsApp groups by again going around to those children's houses by collecting phone numbers um, from teachers and um, from parents to be able to create groups so at least there was some type of feedback mechanism and connection with the teachers while everything was locked down really impressive thank you Another very nice example of the creativity of teachers and, and also the, the, the risks that teachers were willing to take because I'm sure that going on home visits uh, was not self-evident for many teachers. And knowing 
that uh, they would uh, yeah, maybe uh, incur risks of contamination whatsoever. Um, indeed, uh, I, I'm thinking yeah. that maybe in the next few days we will see further examples of um, such creativity and, and heroic uh, behavior. I can. Yes, was that Rifat? Yes, yes. Yes, please. Uh, I was trying to uh, remember the, the stories that I hear from the teachers. Actually, uh, uh, the, the word hero is very important. And if after this uh, uh, webinar, we should even uh, scale up this word to see mm -hmm. how we can uh, sh uh, bring all these uh, success stories. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, heroes among the teachers uh, who's really develop uh, application on the, in, the, in the phone. Uh, because they know that uh, some of the families, they cannot uh, get computer or they have uh, one laptop in their uh, houses. So, but the, the iPhone or is much easy that the people can get. So the application has been developed on the uh, iPhone and the application has sent it freely to the students where the family, the parents, the mothers, the fathers, uh, and even the neighbors can work with the student in the same application. Uh, they can, uh, it's very easy, uh, including games, uh, but also they focus on the main uh, things, which is the reading, writing, and mathematics. Uh, and still, uh, they are develop the, developing their self in a forum where they are trying to bring all the heroes, if I can name it, from the teachers, who can also uh, try to describe what he did in this uh, pandemic. There is a lot of heroes, but uh, for me, the most heroes in this pandemic is the mothers. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is, Can't, uh, may I say something? Yes. So, I mean, to, to, to me, I mean, one of the questions um, that the pandemic brought about uh, more forcefully than we had thought before um, is the role, uh, of course, of the family, but but also others in the community um, in education. Um, I mean, the teachers have the, the primary role. I mean, we, we all agree, um, but uh, the, the parents are fundamental. And, and, and one of the constituencies that uh, we don't look uh, that much at um, are either the alumni uh, of schools uh, or just members of the community, right? And uh, I mean, I do a lot of volunteer work outside of my work at the World Bank. And uh, I know extraordinary people uh, before COVID, COVID has nothing to do with it, right? Um, that, that, that have been dedicating a ton of volunteer work. Uh, sometimes they want financial resources, but more importantly, the volunteer work. And, and, and one example I, I just want to mention is the issue of tutoring um, that can make a huge difference. Um, in learning, uh, I'm talking here about tutoring, mostly after school, uh, but sometimes uh, even uh, within the schools, um, and also the link between the schools and the local community. I mean, I have in mind uh, that uh, principal in Burkina Faso who created um, this link uh, with uh, businesses um, in his community for them to go to the school and talk about uh, what jobs people might have afterwards. He's a secondary school, even creating a little um, a business center that the students actually are, are managing for the, 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 the furnitures, the pencils or whatever they can use in the schools. I, I think that um, one of the things we should uh, take as a lesson uh, from, from this whole pandemic is, is uh, the, the role of others in supporting the teachers and, and what we can do uh, to try to um, increase uh, the impact and, and mobilization. Um, uh, so, I mean, I don't know if what I said is, is, is coherent, um, but, but I think that most of the people who did a great, great service and were heroes uh, during the pandemic were actually uh, doing that before and we do that after. Um, and uh, that, that broader community, how do we manage to, to make it support the school at a very practical uh, level? I think that matters a lot. Thank you very much. Um... Maybe paradoxically, uh, we are focusing more on private initiative, uh, but um, Mr. Sabah already highlighted a lot of, say, more structural questions that uh, arise from this COVID crisis. And uh, I would like now 
to move to the second part of the discussion, which is about, say, the more structural political issues related to, um, say, um, restoring the learning loss, um, closing the gap also, because um, we have uh, noticed that um, inequalities in education have strongly increased and learning poverty is increasing. Um, so what um, are some key messages that you want to convey to say, the policy level at national and international uh, level? Um, it's not necessary to repeat messages from the um, presentations you gave, but maybe there are some remaining um, messages that you want to, to highlight um, before we close the session. So, um, yeah, Linda, to begin with. Thank you. I would just like to emphasize the, the real need for preparedness um, going forward. There may be another public health emergency in the future. You never know, but there is definitely a climate crisis. Um, having flexibility and agility built into education systems to cope with various crises is really important, has always been important, but I think this particular crisis has really highlighted that. Um, we've just published a report actually on the resilience of education systems from lessons learned on the continuity of education over the COVID crises. And having these things embedded into the education system also equipping teachers better for digital learning um, and for expansion of that access but accessibility of tv radio digital learning is all all of that is super important and will take time in many contexts so having that built in into both the preparedness and response of education systems is is going to be crucial moving forward um, which will take dedicated funding. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I think it's very important to be prepared for the next crisis. And um, yeah, there's one tendency of uh, getting back to normal and people are very happy to reopen classes, etc. cetera. Um, but um, yeah, we should um, be aware of the, 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 the risks um, that may pop up in the, in the future. And, um, undoubtedly, our education systems need to become more flexible and combine uh, distance um, tools with face-to-face uh, -face education, etc. That is one important lesson. Uh, some other lessons? Uh, Anna Porni, would you want to highlight? I was actually really echoing. Oh, sorry. Um, I was really echoing uh, Linda's thoughts. I really feel that um, our teachers were taken by surprise uh, this time. But next time we have an opportunity to prepare them and skill them better to cope with a scenario like this. Um, the second thing um, I felt was that uh, once schools reopen, giving students enough time to catch up and uh, focus on basic foundational language and math rather than delving right into the academic curriculum or grade level teaching, give because many students have been out of school for more than two years of their academic life. So giving students and teachers the time to meet each other at the right level, at the right learning level, at the right pace, so that they have the time to catch up the learning loss that has happened, giving them first few months to do that, first 100 days, first few months, just focusing on the language and math skills that are needed to move forward rather than moving into a grade level curriculum right away. You're right. I think uh, th there's a risk uh, that uh, with the rigidity of current um, education systems uh, with um, different class levels and, and uh, curricula that are tailored to a particular class level, um, we will not be able to cope with the diversity of, of um, learning issues. And, and there's a need for a lot of flexibility and adaptation of uh, and prioritizing the basics, and that's uh, your main point. Um, Rifat, uh, would you like to add a point? Very briefly, because time is running out. Yes, yes. Uh, I, the solidarity. The solidarity is very important if we want to face and come up over this crisis and to face the coming uh, financial crisis without solidarity at the national level, at the global level, at the international level, we will not uh, reach there safely. Mm -hmm. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah.
um, and I, I like not only the, the say your call for warm solidarity, but also the the necessity to uh, cope with tax evasion and to um, to tackle issues of um, debt accumulation and so on, which are the more structural aspects of solidarity. Quentin, last word from you. Well, um, there is so much that could be said, right, in terms uh, of broad messages for policymakers. And I mean, whether UNICEF, uh, the World Bank or others, we have so many reports that we put out. Um, I mean, I don't know who is attending this conference. Uh, and, and, and my guess was that uh, a lot of the people who are attending are actually people who are in NGOs and, and trying to implement projects uh, in developing countries, right? Uh, and if that's the case, uh, then um, echoing also what Anapurni said, um, I mean, the, the first priority uh, for the next uh, few years uh, will be to, to catch up on the learning losses uh, in the early grades. Um, but this is also so fundamental to give a chance uh, for those children to, to move up uh, the ladder, right? To complete primary school, go to secondary school and so on. And so um, uh, the reason why I presented that report um, of the World Bank and, and an advisory group on what are good buys, best buys and, and not so good buys is because I think it's, it's so fundamental for the work of NGOs. Um, and so my, my parting words would be, um, uh, if indeed you are NGOs, I mean, of course, you know what you're doing, uh, but if there is um, some insights that you can get uh, from that, that broader literature on what works and, and what actually does not work, um, I think that's very important, especially for uh, learning in the early grades, because that is what is going to, 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 to make a difference, um, the largest uh, difference long term. Okay, the focus on early years, uh, very important. And in addition, I think uh, the emphasis on catching up is also uh, extremely important. Uh, lessons from the past, as far as I have seen the literature, uh, show that um, learning crisis uh, in other circumstances through strikes or um, uh, natural disasters, whatever, um, have not um, um, been, uh, the, the, the damage has not been repaired really. Uh, so the, the risk of permanent scars for our youth uh, through that loss of uh, education, um, those risks are very serious. And yet we can learn from uh, existing experiments, um, maybe on a smaller scale, uh, with accelerated learning programs. I think we need to focus on that uh, in the near future. Okay, we are running over time, but I, I still have a few points uh, that come from the audience. And uh, in the first place, there is uh, some support, um, mainly to Mr. Uh, Sabah, um, who spoke about, uh, say, the, the, the risk of privatization. And Audrey from Africa um, pinpoints that, uh, that issue and, and says, well, um, let's um, yeah, be careful not to... Uh, leave the education sector to uh, privatization, uh, at least um, to the commercial uh, privatization. And that's not, this is more a statement of support than a question. A question um, that arises, and uh, it's, um, the, the phrasing is fairly long, but it boils down to the issue of quality. How can we make sure that quality um, rises again and, and that we uh, are really able to, um, to provide um, good learning opportunities, uh, a strong, um, powerful learning environment to students. That's also a challenge for uh, the panelists to um, give a comment in, say, uh, one minute each at most. Who wants to kick off? I'm sure Quentin will have lots to say, but if I could just kick us off with um, formative assessments, learning where children are in their learning journey and making sure you're teaching at the right level is super important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Formative assessments. Um, feel free also to, um, to refer to some publications and this is an opportunity to uh, uh, draw attention of the audience to uh, resources that can be used um, for uh, quality education. Anna Porni, any further thoughts? Um, teaching at the right level would be what I would echo as well, uh, to say that meeting students at the level they are at 
giving them the content according to the assessment and the learning level they are and created access creating accelerated learning programs so that they move up the ladder faster mm -hmm. um so i mean instead of moving hurriedly into what we need to delve in later take catching our breaths and focusing on what the basics that need to be established or the foundation that needs to be set would be how i feel we can ensure quality good point uh, the learning level does no longer coincide with age eh? as it uh, used to be in the past in say normal circumstances and um, i think this also relates very well to linda's point on uh, formative assessment because formative assessment allows you to teach uh, young people at uh, at the right level rifat uh, any point you want to make on quality Yes, uh, I, I think there is something that uh, we learn from this uh, pandemic re regarding the immunity of teachers, the immunity that the teacher need, not just uh, because in this crisis, uh, we discovered that uh, the teachers also, they don't have uh, the enough uh, skills uh, to face the crisis, despite we are uh, a passing the crisis after a crisis. Uh, so uh, in this crisis, we should learn, uh, the lesson that we should have learned is how we can really give the, the teachers the immunity, which means that you are um, preparing uh, them very well in different uh, sites. And for example, now in this pandemic, they say the psychosocial respect the, the psychosocial uh, respect was very weak. The teachers themselves, they don't, uh, nobody take care about them because most of the people, they take care about the children. But we forget that the teacher them, themselves has been affected psychologically from the pandemic. So the immunity for the teachers is very important to be able even to come over with the learning loss that uh, Mr. Cotton insists that this is the first priority. This is, we will not be able to solve this problem unless we really build the immunity inside the teachers from all, uh, from different sides. Thank you. Thank you. Another challenge for teachers eh, to continue learning and to broaden their set of skills, not just the technological skills, but also psychological and, and yeah, supporting skills and social skills, especially um, for teachers. Thank you. Uh, Quentin, a last point or? Sure. Um, I mean, again, what you need to do to improve quality depends a lot on context, right? And, and which country you are in and, and uh, the, the, the level of income and, and, and performance of the country. But um, I want to mention scripted lessons. Um, which uh, sometimes uh, has a bad uh, press um, with people saying, well, it, it kind of cuts uh, the, the freedom of the teachers to uh, expand on, on what the teacher is, is teaching. But, but frankly, I mean, if we are talking about some of the countries in which uh, the Belgian cooperation is the most involved, right? They, they are low income countries in Africa. Uh, in those countries, uh, a, a large majority of the teachers do not uh, master at all uh, what they are teaching, right? Um, and so scripted lessons can help them um, teach better and, and focus um, and, 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 and practice more. Now you need uh, coaching as well. Uh, it's not only scripted lessons, but uh, I, I think that this should be mentioned in, in very low income context as one of the ways uh, to improve uh, quality in the early grades. Uh, and maybe I should just mention one more thing. Uh, I mean, many of our organizations, UNICEF, World Bank, uh, Pratam, others, uh, we have uh, some tools um, uh, that we can share. I mean, the World Bank created recently um, a tool to assess uh, teachers um, and to coach them. I mean, it's actually a tool, uh, teach and coach are two tools, uh, and those are uh, available uh, for free. And that's one of the reasons why they were made, uh, because uh, it, it enables everybody to use them as, as opposed to having to pay for some of the commercially uh, made available tools. 
Um, so the, the more we can encourage education systems to use those tools, not to, to include, evaluate uh, the teachers, but, but to enable them to, to do better, uh, I, think, I think the better, right? So maybe I was too long, but I wanted to mention those two things, scripted lessons, and then uh, some of those tools that many of our organizations have um, that even NGOs uh, can, can actually use. Thank you very much. I just yes. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to uh, conclude with the last point: is not to forget the education heroes who kind of helped us in the last two years. So, since the community participation and parents have really been the core strength in the last two years, once school starts, let's not again run in silos of community and school separately instead draw connections between the two so that quality can be maintained both in school but also be supported at home. Thank you, that's uh, indeed a very useful addition. Um, I have a last, a very last question which is a practical one uh, from uh, Ikman Nurbatra. Um, thank you for the great presentation she said or he says, I don't know. Uh, uh, I wonder, is there any grants or programs accessible to individuals from developing countries to empower the communities in the educational sector? Any programs for support to communities operating in the, the education sector? I see people thinking and, and keeping silent. Maybe we well, should... Yes, I mean, please. No, I mean, uh, just, just to say that, I mean, for, for international organizations such as uh, UNICEF and the World Bank and others, I mean, while we do sometimes support um, uh, NGOs and so on, uh, quite a bit of the support goes to governments, right? Uh, and so it's more difficult for us to, to, to really uh, be able to provide that support. Um, uh, but, but there are a wide range of foundations that do provide support to NGOs. Um, uh, so what could be actually very useful, I don't know who wants to do it, <laughs> is to try to uh, put together a list of those. Um, and, and more generally, I think that uh, perhaps what could be done it is uh, for the participants, and since I guess people registered and so we have their emails, uh, is that after this conference, we could put together perhaps a two or three pages uh, with a number of links uh, that people could use uh, to access uh, reports or even uh, for that last questions, some of the foundations that do provide uh, direct support to NGOs. That will be very useful indeed. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I invite the speakers also to keep forwarding some documentation uh, if they like to uh, say supplement their um, wonderful presentations. And uh, I also enjoyed the discussion very much. Um, I think we can close now this, uh, this session and I hand over to um, Maria again for some closing words. Thank you. Thank you to all. Voilà, c'est parti, le premier jour de la conférence internationale d'Educate, Education Heroes, est fini. Je tiens à vous remercier les intervenants, Quentin de la Banque mondiale, Linda de l'UNICEF, Anna Porni de Pratam et Réfat de la campagne mondiale pour l'éducation. Merci vraiment de tout cœur de votre investissement. Euh, merci aussi à IDES d'avoir euh, rondement mené euh, la modération de cette discussion. Euh, vraiment un grand merci, Ides. Euh, merci également à la ministre de la coopération au développement, Myriam Kittir, et à Margot qui a pris sa place aujourd'hui. Merci à Plan International d'avoir rendu tout cela possible. Euh, et merci à vous, le public, de nous avoir suivis, d'avoir posé les questions dans le chat. On sera de retour demain pour le deuxième jour de la euh, conférence. Cette fois-ci, on vous amène sur le continent africain. Euh, à la rencontre, on va à la rencontre des super-héros de l'éducation euh, avec des interventions des différents pays, euh, allant du Togo jusqu'en Ouganda. Euh, N'oubliez pas, il est toujours temps de vous inscrire sur le site internet educate.be pour les sessions de demain, de mercredi, euh, donc mercredi, demain, jeudi et vendredi. 
Les enregistrements de cette journée seront disponibles sur le site ce soir. Euh, les présentations également. Et n'oubliez pas, si vous voulez continuer à communiquer autour de la conférence, c'est en mentionnant la hashtag Education Heroes. Je vous dis au revoir. Je vous dis une bonne journée, une bonne soirée en fonction d'où vous nous écoutez. Et on se retrouve demain pour la deuxième journée. Merci beaucoup à vous et passez une bonne journée. Merci. Au revoir.